The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning. I'm typing away saying good morning to Renee and Elvira. And I only got Renee in, but I'm going to push it anyway. Uh, and good morning to Ka. I'm not, I'm not good at the typing and talking at the same time. Uh, but good morning, everybody. I'm so thrilled to be here. I'm Shannon Penrod, and I'm going to be with you for the next hour live. We are live today. It is Thursday, June 23rd, 2022. And excited to, to be here with all of you. We're going to be doing a different show today um, that I'm really excited about. Good morning to Laurie. Good morning to morning to Carl. So glad that you're all here with us this morning. Please feel free. The chat is open. And like I said, we are live. You can be writing in in the live show. For those of you who are watching us recorded, just know that the live shows, we, we do them live uh, at 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Please figure out what time that is in your time zone. Uh, and when you can join us live, it's really fun. Hello. Far, far all. I don't know which flag that is. Oh, is that Canada? I, it's so small on my screen. Uh, so, but I think that's Canada. I think I see a maple leaf. Uh, so thrilled that you're here with us. And good evening from India to Arnob. So thrilled that you are here with us. I love that when you guys write in and tell us where you're watching from, because I feel like we're, we're all just connected, you know? Um, because we are, and we can be, thanks to the internet. Traven is showing you right now some of the different ways that you can watch the, the live show, some of the different ways that you can catch the podcast. And I, for those of you who watch and podcast, which I got to say is the vast majority of you, I don't want you to feel left out of the conversation. You know, you can always write in. We have a, um, a live chat that's on autism-live.com, which I don't know if you know this, but if you go to Autism Network and just click on Autism Live, it takes you directly there. It's all connected. Um, but the chat is there and you can write in, it's not interactive. We can't write back to you in that format, but you can write things in and ask questions. Those, that's where I get my starter questions for Ask Dr. Doreen, which we do live on Tuesdays. So, um, we love, 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 love interaction with you guys. Cause you know, we started this show almost 11 years ago now, and the whole driving force of it was that we wanted to provide information and inspiration. And I feel like the, the show is better when you guys write in and say what you need and what you want. Yes, it's Canada. Um, oh, thank you. And you say that you always watch the jargon of the day. I hope you know that there's a playlist of all of the jargons of the day uh, that's on our YouTube channel that you can go uh, Traven, our producer does such a good job. And on the, on the, if you go to YouTube, there's a bunch of different playlists and you can, you can search anything, right? But the playlists help you to be able to access very specific things. Like if you just want the recipes, there's a whole section on recipes. If you just want to ask Dr. Doreen, there's a whole section for ask Dr. Doreen, but there is a playlist for jargon of the day. And uh, we love this. I was saying, explaining this to somebody the other day that the hilarious thing about jargon of the day is that we started it because I said, you know, we need to do a, a, a kindness for the world and for me, to be honest, because these jargon terms, man, they, they're just so overwhelming, right? And I said, I really want to be able to make sure that there's a place where overwhelmed parents can go and learn these jargon terms and, and have somebody translate it. And I said, I think it'll be a, a funny, you know, but informational bit because we give the actual definition and then I make fun of it. And then we give a working definition. And I try to put it into context for you. So that was my whole thing was I said, this is strictly for parents um, and, and it will help them. And then the really hilarious irony of the whole thing is that now universities, there are so many universities who show them and make them required uh, viewing for students that are in their psychology and autism programs. Why? Because some of them tell us that it helps them to understand the terms, but more importantly, what I'm hearing from so many professionals is that they watch to figure out how to explain the terms to parents because it's super hard for them that once they know what the term is, they, they, they're like, how would I explain this to a parent? 
that's just crazy to me, but super fun. I'm glad to be of service all the way around. Um, and we love the jargon of the day too. So thank you. And Traven has given you the, the direct playlist so that you can go. Cause I love if you're in a meeting, sometimes, you know, I always advocate saying, Hey, what does that mean? But you know, sometimes you just can't because you don't, time is of the essence. You're paying for somebody's time or you want to get to the next thing. So you write down the term and you go and search it. It's like, no help to you whatsoever. So I hope you'll, if you ever come across a term you don't know, I hope you will go search it on our playlist. And if it's not there, tell us. We've been trying to catch up on a bunch of the jargon terms that you guys have given us that are new. Uh, Arnab says, I listen to you every day from India, though it's late night here in uh, Kolkata. Uh, actually, it helps a lot. Oh, that makes me so happy. And I hope that today's topic is going to be something really helpful to you. And uh, Fariel says, uh, thank you so much. I've learned uh, I've learned ABA from you. You are incredible. No, you are. Uh, no, you. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm glad because, you know, this, this is the mission. We want to be of service. So please check us out wherever you can watch us. Uh, oh, look, look at this love fest, you guys. I'm just loving you so much. Uh, Renee and Elvira says, I've learned so much watching this show. Very thankful. I have to say, because Traven, Traven told me this morning, so, you know, I always tell you at the start of the show, I'm not an expert. And that's the truth. I'm not an expert. Uh, but I am somebody who's been around the block a time or two, and I have some wisdom. Let's say that. And I tried to take all of my wisdom and put it in one place because, you know, I'm getting old. And, uh, you know, someday I might have grandbabies and I might need to go do other things, you know? So I thought we need to put it everywhere. Uh, everything that we've learned thus far, not saying we're done, but uh, all in one place. So I wrote, I wrote this book. It just came out a couple of weeks ago. And apparently there's only four copies left right now on Amazon, which is awesome, but they say they're getting more. So don't panic. And if for some reason you get there and it isn't there, Future Horizons has it too. You can go to FH Autism dot com and um and then you have the book so with which is pretty much you know uh, um everything i've learned thus far but we used to do a series of shows where we would just take a topic and we would say hey we're going to talk about this topic parent to parent and that's what it is today i don't i'm not bringing in an expert here to talk about tantrums and meltdowns because that's the topic for today it's you and me it's all of us and and when I say parent to parent, I'm going to put it in language that a parent would understand. That doesn't mean that it's only for parents. So because, you know, on this show, we are for everybody. If you are the person that's on the spectrum, oh, my goodness, we're so glad that you're here and having this conversation with us. And we want your input, too. We want to know what it feels like from your end, of course. Right. But when I say parent to parent, that means I'm going to use language that the assumption is that you didn't go and get a degree in psychology and a master's degree in autism, right? Although there are people who have that, um, you know, um, but assuming that you don't and you still want the information because it's important to you, because you know what we say here on our show, that this show is for everybody in the autism community. The folks who are on the spectrum, of course, they're the beating heart of our community, but then we include everyone who loves those individuals. And there are a lot of us, right? We want to be allies. We want to be good students. We want to sit in the front row and raise our hand a lot and ask a lot of questions. Well, today is the day uh, we're going to take apart tantrums and meltdowns from that perspective and talk about this. And if you were watching yesterday, you know that our topic this entire week has been about making sure that we leave room for empathy and for compassion. And this is a very important topic for me because, because as a parent, when my son, look, all kids have tantrums, right? And some, I would say a lot of kids have meltdowns at some point, right? Or at least one in their life. I guess that there are some kids who don't, I, I just am not related to them and don't know them, but I guess it's possible, right? But all kids have tantrums. In fact, it's considered a, a, a warning sign if kids aren't having any tantrums, right? That's something to be talked about with your pediatrician. So, and yet when my son was diagnosed with autism, there were so many other symptoms that came along with that, that made it scary because he lost language. He, you know, was having reactions to things that I couldn't understand, which then in my head, because of, you know, how we're raised in this society went to, and people use words like weird, odd, strange, right? Which then, because these are our favorite people on the planet, 
these are our children, that feels horrible. When suddenly your child is doing something that you don't understand, whew, right? Doesn't feel good. When you don't have an ability to communicate with them, ooh, extra level. And then when other people are labeling it odd, weird, or strange, and you don't have a context to understand it, it feels crushing, right? So it's important to me that we talk about all this. We demystify tantrums and meltdowns so that we have an understanding of what it is, that there is nothing odd, weird, strange at all about the fact that our kids are in, engaged in this behavior. Let's, and I feel like, because when we take the fear out of it, then we can get busy, right? Good afternoon, Kayla. We're so glad that you're here from North Carolina. We're talking about tantrums and meltdowns. We're live right now. Anybody who's just joining us, it is June 23rd, 2020. Crazy that it's that year, right? 22, excuse me, not 2022. Look, that's how far behind I am. But we're talking about tantrums and meltdowns and starting to talk about it from a place of empathy and compassion. You know, a lot of the times we talk about... Um, perspective taking and that for individuals on the autism spectrum, it's considered that it could be a deficit, not always, but it could be a deficit for them that they're not good at seeing it from another person's point of view. Now, here's the irony about that. You, we've found that you can teach anybody perspective taking. And what I have found is that when we have individuals who are on the autism spectrum, they're very capable of perspective taking when you teach it to them. In fact, they get so good at it that they're better at the re than the rest of us and we have to run to catch up with them. And this is a little bit of a per perspective taking exercise that we need to, ha to have empathy and compassion when somebody is having a tantrum or a meltdown takes perspective taking. But information is power, right? Knowledge is power. So we're going we're gonna to start to take this apart. But if you have specific questions about tantrums and meltdowns that you want to bring to the group so that we can talk about it as a group, please feel free to be writing into that chat right now. I especially want to know how you feel when a tantrum or meltdown is happening. And that could be you're having a tantrum or meltdown or that someone you love is having a tantrum or meltdown. Or it could be that you're in the store and you see somebody else having a tantrum or a meltdown or somebody else's kid having a tantrum or meltdown. But I want to talk about first what that feels like. Because I don't want to assume that what it felt like for me and what it feels like for me is what it feels like for you or for the people that you love in your life. And I think it's good when we take the flashlight and go, hey, this is how I feel. This is the truth of it. Because then somebody else goes, you know, I never really thought about it before. But, you know, I feel a little bit that way, too. And for me, I felt like it was a loss of control. And it felt in the moment, you know, because sometimes what things feel like. We have to own up to what they feel like. It isn't necessarily true, right? But for me, it felt like a loss of control that was permanent forever, <sighs> right? When my kid would start to escalate and have a tantrum, I would start stacking and I would go, well, you know, we're going to have to leave this McDonald's playland and we're never going to be able to go to another McDonald's playland. There will never be a time that we're able to do anything. And that means we're not going to be able to be on a plane, right? And, and, and I would just stack that sucker up to, and what it would amount to is life is over. Our lives are over. That wasn't true. Um, but, um, oh, interesting. Somebody said, I have empathy for other people's kids, but not my son. I feel sad because I feel like I have to walk on eggshells and I shouldn't have to. I'm so glad you're here with us today because we're going to talk about all this. Uh, somebody else says, I feel out of control, very uncomfortable and stuck. Uh, and Amanda's here with her blue hearts. I love that, Amanda. Um, but if we own up to that and say, yes, that's what it feels like. It feels like I am out of control. I have no control in this circumstance. And I'm a big believer in the serenity prayer, which says, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change and the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And I find that this is very true for tantrums and meltdowns because there's a great deal that we can control and there's a great deal that we can't control. And the peace and the serenity is an understanding the difference between the two. Um, and and uh, somebody says, I'm a fixer and I don't know what to do to fix it. Uh, you're in the right place. So let's talk about what tantrums are and the natural progression of tantrums because we've already identified that 
all kids are supposed to have tantrums. And if they don't have tantrums, that that literally is something that you should be talking about with your pediatrician saying, this kid is so go with the flow, doesn't ever fuss, doesn't, you know, because we have an expectation. There is a thing called the terrible twos. It's a very poor name for something because it can start happening when kids are one and it continue happening their entire life. And you and I both know adults who are not on the spectrum who continue to throw tantrums. Do we not? We do. So calling it a terrible two is inappropriate, but we're familiar with the term, right? It's that normal that there's a term for it. So, and the reason why tantrums happen is because babies are born and when they're born, the only means, you know, I, I, I marvel, I watch horses, horses have their babies and within a half an hour, that horse is standing and walking. That baby horse is standing and walking. Our babies don't do that. Our babies take like a year to be able to stand and walk. And there's all these developmental milestones that they have to go through before they walk. And part of it is, is that our brains are very complex and there's a lot of connections that are being made. And some of them have to do with communication. And everybody thinks that this is just speech, that we're talking about speech. It really isn't. There's all kinds of communications that happen with babies that make connections. And in the beginning, though, it's kind of a level playing field. All babies are born and their way to communicate is, can you guess, crying. And we now have identified that there are several different types of crying, right? There's the crying when I'm cold. There's the crying when I'm hungry. There's the crying when I have gas. There's, there's crying when I need sensory input. I need to be held or rocked. And we all sort of understand this when babies are born. And some people are very in tune to their babies, what the cry is. I never was. I, you know, please tell me if you guys were in tune to what your babies, that was a little bit before my son was born. Uh, when they were saying, well, this cry means this. I, I still don't, I, and I have a very good ear. I don't, I, I couldn't quite tune my ear to anything. I, I don't know what that is. But some people, they're like, oh no, that's the crying that they're hungry. But I was told very definitively when my child was born, if they're crying, there's like, you know, five things that they need. And what you do is you just cycle through all of them. You kind of look at them and you go, are they hot? Um, you know, I'm going to try to give them, you know, water or, or milk or, you know, whatever they're e eating or drinking at this point in time. I'm going to see, are they cold? Do they, you know, just, does, does their belly feel a little, just, I'm going to, you know, rock them. I'm going to give them that proprioceptive, you, you know, rocking or, or in my family, we call it thumping a baby's butt, which helps them to pass gas. Right. And then they erp. And maybe they spit up a little bit on your shoulder, your outfit is ruined, but they have a release and now they stop crying, right? And then there are some babies that have colic that the crying continues and continues and continues, right? And I've had friends that have had those babies. Um, Ken says, I know when my non-speaking grandson is going to have a meltdown and I can deal with the screaming and crying, but the self-injury breaks my heart. Ken, I'm glad you're here. We're going to talk about all of this, right? So stay with me. Um, but, you know, the main thing is here that, that two things are happening when babies are little. They cry and we react and we set up a dance that we do over and over and over again. Baby cries, we react. And we may not react efficiently at first, but it, we cycle through those five things and we eventually find what makes the stop, the crying stop. Although if it's a colicky baby, eventually we might have to go to a doctor. There might be medicines. Some moms have to stop breastfeeding because there are things in the breast milk that are making them be extra gassy, right? There are considerations. There is no one size fits all. Um, but still, this communication train starts. I cry, you react. I cry, you react. I cry, you react. And we make deep grooves in the brain that if I cry, you're going to react in some way my life is going to get better. So it is no mistake that at a point when language is developing and we're talking about if all things were equal and everything went as it was supposed to do, then language would start to develop and there would be a period of time when the child starts to understand, hey, I have all these other modes of communication besides cry, react, cry, react, cry, react, right? So I'm going to try to ask for milk or juice, or toy, or the, you know, whatever, mom, whatever it is that I want. And in the beginning, it's not efficient. 
even with the most typical kid, and let's say exceptional kid who, who's learning language at the fastest rate, they don't just all of a sudden sprout at one year old and can say full sentences that everybody understands, right? There's always a period of time where the communication is not effective, efficient, right? Even though they're making the attempt. And that's when we get the tantrums. Because that loss of control that we feel, imagine, this is the like the perfect lesson because when the tantrum happens, you know how horrible it feels for us that we feel out of control? That's what it feels like for them. I know what I want. I know that I want to tell you what I want and you're not getting it. So I'm going to revert back to the last thing that worked. I'm going to cry because before that's what worked. Doesn't it all make sense when we look at it through that? We taught them, you cry, I react. Now we're going to teach them something else. And for some of our kids, their acquisition of the skills of being able to communicate my needs takes longer. Notice that I didn't say it doesn't happen. It just takes longer. And sometimes it might take very specific teaching to give them the skills to be able to tell us what they need. And telling us what they need isn't always vocal, but it is a verbal skill. Um, verbal skills, again, can be that I point to it. It can be that I make a sign and I tell you more, right? It can be that I point to a picture of it. It can be that I push a button on an iPad and the iPad says the word for me, right? There are lots, that's all verbal, by the way. It's just not all vocal. And, and we know that the vast, uh, the vast percentage of communication is verbal, not vocal, Vocal's great. We all want vocal communication for our kids. We're all working hard for it. And we know that more and more kids are getting that vocal communication. But I just want to caution everybody, it's not everything. Being able to communicate our needs in whatever, whatever you know, you do it every day. There are times when, you know, you'll just, you'll point to your coffee cup and the waitress comes and fills it up, right? You didn't have to say, I want more coffee. There are times as a teacher that I would just have to do this to a student and they knew exactly what I meant, right? So, um, okay. Uh, reacting is reinforcement key says, yes, it certainly can be. It's a form of attention. And when somebody cries and we give them what we want, we're telling them, keep, please keep crying. Crying is what works. Crying is what I understand. It is how you and I communicate. And, and we're not wrong and they're not wrong. When they were babies, that's the only mode we had. But now there are more, as they age, there are more things that are available to them. It's just that sometimes, here's the rub, you guys, sometimes it's just miraculous and they get it on their own. And that does happen. And there are lots of kids that go through the terrible twos and they fuss a little bit about it, but then they realize, oh, you just didn't understand what I said. And their diction gets a little bit better and it's worthwhile to them. And they sail happily into whatever existence they have. I, there's always problems. There's always problems down the road, but it seems miraculous to us, right? That just happened. You didn't have to stop and teach these things and break it down and understand the chain of behavior. Yeah, no, that's some people's existence. It's not ours. So we deal with the feelings of that. And then we go, all right, teach it to me. What's the pattern of what? So my child is having a tantrum because he wants this. How can I, what are the skills that I need to teach him so that, or her, so that they can appropriately ask for it? How can I reinforce that behavior? How can I stop reinforcing the you cry, you get it model? How do I break that chain? Because we've been doing that dance sometimes for two years, sometimes for 20 years, right? So, and, and the longer you're doing it, the harder it is. And there's a bumpy period of time where you got to hold the fort and go, I'm not going to give the thing that you want for the behavior that we don't want to see anymore. You're biting your brother so that you can get the cookie. You're not going to get the cookie for that, right? It's so cut and dried when I put it that way. You bit your brother to get the cookie. You don't get the cookie, right? That one's easy. It's much harder when your child is throwing a tantrum because they want juice and saying juice is hard for them. 
but we level the playing field and we, we give them something that they can do to request it. So this is when we get into the conversation about functional communication. Everyone has the right to functional communication. And if you have a child who's having tantrums, it is because your child's functional communication, everybody hold onto your cushion seats, right? Because I'm just giving away the keys to the kingdom here. If your child is having tantrums, it's because their level of functional communication is not high enough to meet their need. Now, that's different for different people, right? You might say, but my child is incredibly verbal and talks a blue streak and we're still having tantrums. You can talk till the cows come home and not get your needs met. So let me go back and say it again. If you're having tantrums, then their level of functional communication is not meeting their need. And that's where we have to meet them with empathy and compassion. So that could be a two-year-old who isn't able to say juice. And then we would teach that two-year-old an approximation or and an approximation, by the way, would be saying j, right? Or s, one part of it. And we'd go, yes, j, oos, yes, you get the juice, right? Because that's what they can do right now. We're constantly like pizza dough, pulling that out and making it bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Um, or if they're not able to make the j or the s sound, then we would put a picture of juice and say, do you want juice? And put their finger on it. And, and we touch the picture of juice and we go, juice, you want juice and we give them the juice, right? So that they get the connection. Oh, if I want that, all I got to do is touch this button and you're going to give it to me. Trust me when they get that and they do, they go, oh, that's so much easier than me crying. The crying is so hard. It takes so much energy, right? But if you have a 20 year old who's fully verbal and, you know, is, is capable of saying, I want juice right? But is having a tantrum, then, then we might have to teach something completely different. We might have to teach them to check their states and say, you know, what's, what's going on with you right now? Um, and, and, you know, and it might be that there are other things that are getting in the way. And we're going to talk more about that with meltdowns. Um, uh, Ka says, yes, it's so hard not to react. And then the damage is done. You reacted and reinforced before we know it. Can we all give ourselves a hug and say, that's going to happen. If you think that you're ever going to do this perfectly, you know, I'm just going to, you know, give you a hug and, and pat you on the shoulder and go, it's going to be okay. You know what Ileana Von Sant says, save yourself. There are going to be times when you get it wrong. I know brilliant, brilliant BCBAs who uh, then became parents. And then came back to me and said, oh, Shannon, I get it in a way that I never got before. It's so much harder when it's your kid. So cut yourself some slack. You didn't get up this morning and suddenly had the capability to be perfect. You're not going to, that's not going to happen today. It's not going to happen tomorrow, but we always minimize the damage. So if you react and you notice it and <coughs> you go, darn it, then stop it there. Stop it there and get as back on track as you possibly can. And don't beat yourself up because we we all, all do it. Uh, and Ka says, yes, I'm doing the dance and I need to break the old chain and start a new one. Can I tell you that sometimes it's easier to bring somebody else in and have them help you to break the chain? I used to all the time say to our ABA team, you start it, you start it, and then I'll come in and pick up the mantle. But you know what my ABA team appreciated about me was that once they would start it, I would hold fast to whatever the plan was. And I would have them write up the plan. So he does this, I do this, and then this happens and I don't do this. Right. Because I was somebody who very much was reinforcing, you know, I know I've told this story before, but my son used to bang his head on the kitchen floor. If I would put a demand on him, he would go in the kitchen and he'd, you know, drop down. We called it the Gandhi maneuver, civil disobedience. He's not going to do anything. He was two and three and four when this would happen. And not four. He was done with by, by the time of four. But he would lay there on the kitchen floor. It was the only place in our condo that did not have carpeting. So he was very particular, smart. He would go in and he would just start whacking his head on the kitchen floor. You want to talk about people telling me it was odd and weird and, and my panic and fear and all those things. And our ABA provider came in and said to me first, I had to get sleep because I wasn't prepared to deal with the intervention. And that's really important. Let's take two seconds to talk about that. These interventions are hard. Breaking the dance, 
super hard because we are used to being in the behavior pattern and they are used to be in the, in the behavior pattern. And when somebody does something different than the, than the behavior part pattern, it all feels like the world has gone wrong and every, and you're going to have emotions about it. And what they said to me was you have to be well rested or you you won't hold the line because if it is, you know, my, what would happen is that my son would hit his head on the kitchen floor and I'd have just put a demand on him. By the way, I didn't realize that that's what was going on. I was like, it's just the strangest thing. He just goes in and hits his head on the kitchen floor. I didn't connect that I had put a demand on him. Um, so don't beat yourself up if you have not put that together yet. They had to put it together for me. I could never have done it by myself. But he would go in, hit his head on the kitchen floor, and I would respond like a good parent. I would not allow him to hit his head on the kitchen floor, which meant that I would scoop him up. I would rub his baby head. That is my precious baby boy. And I would rock him. I would take him to the biggest, most comfortable chair we had in the house. And I would rock him. And I would give him a sippy cup with lemonade and his favorite treat to eat. And I would hold him and rock him and give him the treat and say, don't hurt the baby. We, you know, we love our baby. Don't hurt the baby. And he'd be happy. And then I would be happy because my child is no longer hurting himself. It never occurred to me that because he did not have the way to say, could you sit and hold me and rock me and give me lemonade and a cookie? My child didn't have the language to say that. And instead, you know, I would say to him, okay, it's time to stop playing and we got to have lunch now. And, you know, he was like, I don't want to do that. I don't like how this is going, but I know what I have to do now. I mean, this really is essentially what was going on in his brain, even if it wasn't verbal, he was like, I, I don't, I don't like the choice she gave me. Um, I have another option. I know works. If I go hit my head on the floor twice, I'm going to get everything that I want. And so even though that wasn't his favorite thing, and we found out it wasn't his thing because as soon as he learned how to ask Fox and lemonade and a treat and got them by requesting them with functional communication, he never did it again. Right. Um, but he was doing it on a regular basis because I was reinforcing it. Now, if somebody had just come up to me and said, well, you know why that behavior is happening? Because you're reinforcing it. I would have just gone straight up and turned left and I would have hated them. And I wouldn't have listened to anything else that they said, because it feels like blame. This is not about blame, you guys. We all remember we started. He cries. I react. She cries. I react for babies. We've all reinforced crying every single one of us. And we were good parents when we did. Now we're just going to change it. And that's going to be good parenting too. But you're not in a place where you're doing the dance because, because you're a bad parent. That is not a part of this discussion at all. You're not a bad parent. You're a great parent. Okay. Just wanted to be clear about that. Anybody else, you know, sometimes feels like you're a bad parent. Um, you're not. Um, please write in and, and share because I'm sure that there are people who are sitting there going, yeah, no, I'm a bad parent, but you're not. We've all felt that at some point. Okay. Uh, so I've lost my train of thought a little bit because I get so excited talking about this because you know why? When you get this, when you start to understand, and we, we've talked before about the ABCs of behavior, when it clicks in your head and you get it, you go, oh, I have some control here. So let's go back and talk about that, that throughout life, all of us are engaged in what they call the three-term contingency. You don't have to remember that that's what it's called. I just like to call it the ABCs of behavior, that whenever there is a behavior that happens again and again and again, there is this ABC. The A stands for antecedent, which is a fancy schmancy word for something happened before. So something happens and then the B stands for the behavior, the behavior happens and the C stands for the consequence. And we are all engaged in this all the time, all of us. Um, something happens, there's a behavior, and then there's a consequence for it. You, you know, today you, you got up and at some point you got dressed. Something happened that signaled to you that it was time to get dressed. The behavior was that you put clothes on and there is a consequence for that, right? You felt good in your clothes or you felt like crap in your clothes, or you felt like I can go outside now, right? There are always this A, this B and the C. And, and if we take babies, you know, the baby feels hungry. So the behavior is the baby cries. And the consequence is that first we pick them up and rock them. Also not bad, 
But eventually they cried some more and we fed them the A, the B and the C and your kiddos on the spectrum, you on the spectrum, um, you not on the spectrum, your kiddos not on the spectrum, all engaged in this all the time. So here is the secret. We think for some strange reason that we want to control the behavior and that we have control over the behavior. You don't. You don't have control over the behavior. And that's why it feels like you're out of control. Cause you're like, I don't know what to do about the behavior. And we're focused on the behavior and you literally can't take control of the behavior because they are people and they're in a behavior and short of, you know, this is where we get into these discussions about restraint. What are you going to do? Duct tape them to the wall. If somebody, even a two-year-old is engaged in a behavior that they really want to do, they're going to do it. And, and really even restraining them isn't going to stop that because you can't restrain somebody 24 hours a day, nor should you, nor should anybody want to. Right? So I just got to make sure that my Yes, I'm plugged in. My screen went dark for a second. I just thought, am I plugged in? Uh, okay, panic. Uh, okay, so you don't have control over the behavior. And I know you're like, oh, Shannon, how can I not have control over the behavior? Guess what you do have control over? It's much better. You have control over much of the antecedent, what happens before the behavior, and much of what happens after the consequence. And sometimes you have it's more of one than the other. So somebody write in and tell me something that you've noticed that your child has a regular tantrum over. And this is a part of the game too, that you want to be noticing. You want to keep a journal. The experts will call it data. Let's call it a journal <laughs> of, of what's happening, of when is your child having tantrums and asking yourself what happened before, what happened afterwards, and what did it look like when they had the tantrum. Um, and, and I'll tell you, if you keep this data and I always, uh, encourage you, I don't have a piece of paper in front of me, but I, I take a piece of paper and I fold it into three and I make an A column, a B column and a C column. And that's how I keep my journal. You can even do that on your phone now. Right. Um, but if you will share your ABC data with your team, I'm telling you, if you're working with a, a group of uh, providers, whether it's an OT, a speech or, or ABA, they will be able to take that ABC data and they'll be able to change your life with it. You probably can change your life with it on your own. Uh, Ken says, I often tell people, if you think you're in control, you're fooling yourself. Control is an illusion. Absolutely, Ken. Although, Stop and think about it. This is that serenity prayer again, that there are some things that you're in control of. So if your child, let's say, okay, so Ka gave us an example, going to speech after school, he lays down and screams and cries and says no. Okay, so what is our antecedent before the, the laying down on the floor? And I'm going to put some suggestions out there because I don't know. And Ka, if you want to, you can write some things in. But we know for sure that he was in school before. And when school gets out in most schools, the bell rings and kids run out onto the playground and they go home and they play games. And I'm guessing he doesn't have speech every day. So he knows that on some days I leave school and I get to go home and I get to play my video game or I get to play with my friend or I get to take off my shoes and I get to be myself and I don't have people putting demands on me. Right. Um, and in that moment, he can see that everybody else gets to go to do that. But he doesn't get that. He has to go directly to speech, right? Oh, okay. So you have to pick him up from school and we go straight to speech. Okay. But I'm guessing on the days that he doesn't have speech, you do something else, right? And for whatever reason, it's very possible that that something else is infinitely more rewarding for him and meaningful for him than going to speech. So... Our antecedent, we don't really have a whole lot of control over here because, you know, what are you going to take him out of school for the day to take him to speech? No, that's not a, a viable thing, right? Except that we do have a little bit of control of an antecedent here that there could be a break between, um, between school and speech, or even better, there could be a massive reward, something that he only gets on days that he goes to speech, that when you leave school, that, you know, whatever his currency is, and for each kid, this is where it gets really specific. What is his currency? Like, just, 
does he like a McDonald land toy? I don't know if you guys know this, but you can go to McDonald's. I think this is still true, although I haven't done it in years. Um, my son used to like the little toys. They were such a reinforcer and we didn't do the happy meal, but you could go through the drive through, through, you could ask for just, you, you purchase just the toy. And then, and he would only get that for special occasions. Now that was my kid's currency. It probably isn't yours, but, but if there is something that is special that you only get between going for, to school and going to speech, that might be enough. But the reward has to be big enough to counteract the imposition. I think we can all relate to that, right? That, you know, you leave work and you look forward to going home. And sometimes you have to stop someplace that's not super rewarding for us, right? And, and sometimes speech isn't super rewarding. I would also have a, a conversation with the speech teacher and say, whatever you do, the first thing when you get to speech has to be so rewarding and such a special treat, like whatever his favorite thing at speech is, you got to start with that, right? And then consequence, what is the consequence for going to speech? Now, you and I both know that he's probably getting a great deal out of it, but he, you know, it's not meaningful to him at this age. And that's just reality, right? Because he's not going to sit there and go, oh, right, this is going to help me to communicate better. That's, he's a kid you know, that's not his job, right? So we have to make it rewarding. There has to be a consequence for going to speech that isn't a negative. And when you go to speech and you didn't get to be outside playing with kids or you missed out on the show that was on or whatever the big reward and treat is normally, then your consequence for that is negative. So I got, I, I didn't like having to go. I didn't get my break and there's no big reward for me. So there's got to be some big payoff. So you don't have control over the behavior of him laying on the floor and crying. But you do have control over setting him up for success before going to some extent. And you've got a big, massive thing here for consequences that you could put a consequence in place. But the consequence only happens if we go right in and get the speech work done. Like it could be, we've done this with some kids and it's different for everybody. You really got to become a detective here where for some kids, it was, it's the dance has been going on so long with for instance, speech that, um, that we would set up a consequence and say, we're going to go in and you're only going to have to spend one minute at speech. And if you do one minute at speech, we're going to leave if you don't throw a tantrum. And then the next time we make it a minute and a half. And yes, it feels like, oh my gosh, we're wasting all of this speech time, right? But very quickly we get to the point where we're doing 30 minutes and he learns, hey, I can do speech. I can handle it in these increments and I get a huge reward. But it's got to be rewarding. Uh, Ka says, yes, he rides the bus and he loves the bus and we get to have a big snack and he gets to relax. Okay, well, um, is it just the snack on the bus and just the relaxing on the bus or is it more about the bus, the, the sensory thing? Like, do, do we actually need it to be the bus or can we recreate the bus in your car? And whatever the treat is that he gets on the bus, it has to be a bigger treat when he rides in your car. Like maybe he gets to play on his iPad only um, on the way home, on, on the way to speech. And if he doesn't throw a tantrum, then he gets extra iPad time before bed. But that's only if the iPad, this is where, again, it gets really individualistic. It's got to be that the iPad is big currency to him. Stop and think about if your boss was going to ask you to do something at work that you really don't want to do right? And you're like, oh, I just really don't want to do that. And they go, but you know, we're going to give you a raise and you go, all right. But depending on how big the raise is, you know, you might be like, okay, Hey, I, sign me up. I will do that thing that I just said a minute ago that I didn't want to do. Oh, you're going to pay me 10 more grand to do it. Yeah. No, I'm fine with that. Yeah. Woohoo. Let's do it. Right. But for another person, 10 grand would be like, no, it's not worth it. That's time away from my kids. Everybody has a point and everybody has a reinforcer. We're learning with the workforce now. Oh, it says that I am not plugged in, you guys. Hold on, hold on, hold the phone. We are not plugged in. No. I don't know what is wrong. I am plugged in. Hold on. <laughs> yes, we're live. 
I am on the floor. Only with live, right? Are we plugged in now? It says I'm not plugged in, Traven. I don't know what is wrong. Um, I can't tell if I'm plugged in now. Plugged in to the wall. It says I'm, I'm not, my thing is not charging. I can't tell. Okay. Now I'm, now I'm plugged in. Okay. All right. And I light down. Oh, you guys. Uh, could it get worse? <laughs> it's so much fun. Uh, the light went out here. I had to work from home today for other reasons. And it, I did this for two years, but you would think that I'm uh, a novice at this. Why is that not plugged in? Okay. Something is wrong. Well, I've unplugged that. Hold on one more second, you guys. Huh. Okay. There we go. We have light again. Woohoo! And we're supposedly plugged in. All right. Panic, panic. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I love all the advice that you guys gave me. Uh, okay. So about plugging in, uh, it happens to everyone. Thank you. See the compassion and empathy that you guys are demonstrating. That's what we want to uh, show to everybody, right? Uh, okay. So he wants to go. Um, okay. So Ka, you say, you know, that you have to take him directly but to, to speech. But I think this is one of those things that think about how much speech you're losing because he's laying there screaming. Right. And we get into these rigid patterns and school will tell you and they'll say, well, this is the time. Right. But they've got to work with you. And it might be that we have to instead of taking the first 10 minutes to deal with the tantrum that we never really get all the way back from, maybe um, let's take the first 10 minutes and take a break and and have them do something fun with him that he can only do at speech because that's what's compassionate and empathetic. Um uh, Ken says that uh, he wants to go for a car ride and get pizza every night. When I tell him no, he goes directly to screaming and hitting himself. Okay, let's talk about that. That first of all, I'm sending you a hug because that's got to present fear that he's hitting himself. And when we talk in, about self injurious behavior, it's super important that we be working with professionals. And and so because we don't want to make it worse, right? We have seen kids who have hurt themselves before. So I got to be honest with you. My advice to you, Ken, would be that during the day, I would, I would work on this a little bit differently until you can get some other help and support. And so what I would do is I would set up circumstances where he can earn getting pizza every night, going in the car ride, and, but he has got to earn it. So I would set something up for him every day and say, okay, I know that you want pizza tonight and I know that you want to go in the car ride. And so we're going to do that, but here's what you have to do. In order, so the, and, and one of the things would be no tantrums, but you're going to ask nicely, but whatever is appropriate for this individual, this is how you're going to ask for it. And there won't be any tantrums. If you throw a tantrum, there will be no pizza. Because what we need to do is to break the dance is to teach that when you ask for things appropriately, you get them later on, we're going to teach that it's like a slot machine. You don't get it every time, but to break the dance for right now for peace is that you're, you know, and it might be that it's expensive and it's like really horrible and, and that you're like, oh, I don't know that I can really do that. And maybe you can make pizza at home. Uh, and go for a car ride and have the pizza that you have at home. Maybe you can talk to the pizza parlor and get them to give you a pizza that you freeze because, you know, you can't always get to the pizza parlor. And we're not setting this up to be forever. This is just until you can get somebody in the house to help you to work with the further thing. Because there's going to come a day when you're going to say, today we're not going to get pizza but here, here's the thing that you're going to do. You're going to do something more fun than the pizza. And I know that right now you're probably thinking, oh, Shannon, there isn't anything more fun than pizza. But we're, we're going to figure out what that might be. 
Um, I know a family that they were trying to get their child to take a pill and they were going through a pill swallowing clinic. And the dad said to the daughter, when you can take the pill and we don't have to crush it all up and go through the gagging and the whole thing, the day that you can take a pill, the minute you take the pill, we're getting in the car and we're going to Disneyland. And I remember everybody was like, oh, geez, don't promise that because you're going to have to, you're going to have to get in. What if it's like in the middle of a work day? And, and the dad was like, I don't care. This is how big this is in our lives. And that little girl swallowed a pill and she looked at her dad and he was like, everybody get in the car. <laughs> and they went to Disneyland because sometimes teaching that form of communication to your child of, Hey, here's the trust cycle. Now you're going to do this and I'm going to do this and you're going to get all the good things in life secret to everything. So, but I think you need some help, Ken, because when we're talking about self-injurious behavior, what your child is saying is, I want this and I want it bad enough and I don't know how else to get it and I'm willing to hurt myself over it. And we don't want to teach that at all. So I would just, you know, nip everything, but I wouldn't give it to him for free. I would figure out and the first day make it something that you know that he could do anyway. So today you want pizza and you want to go for a car ride, that's great. All you have to do is, and it's something that you know for sure he can already do and that he wants to do. And you go, great, you did it. Because that teaches him, oh, I just have to do what you, you know, ask me to do. And then I'm, then I've communicated my need to you. Then an expert's going to come in and teach him about his feelings, about pizza and, the, and self-regulation and all of those things. But the self-injurious piece, because it's already there, I think you 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 got to have some experts there to deal with that. Um, Ka says, I even got him nuggets and Sprite so he could eat on the way and he was still upset. But he has a new speech teacher on this day and it's an AAC training and he seems to hate the AAC. Okay. Well, I would definitely talk to that speech teacher and I would... Um, you know, really deal with this like it is the problem, because it is, and say, how can we make this the most re reinforcing thing in the world? And it might be that, look, there's stuff that we don't know. And I don't, I don't want to scare you because sometimes kids are, I, I hate to use the word traumatized, but let's use it. Sometimes kids are traumatized by a, a confluence of events being at a speech teacher. It could be that an alarm went off one day and that he's living in fear that an alarm will go off again. It doesn't have to be something that is so nefarious that we can't handle it, right? Um, although those things happen too. But, but right now he's in a pattern where this is not reinforcing. So it's going to take a while. It's going to be massaging that pizza. And you got to talk to the new speech teacher and say, I really need you to build trust with him. I really need, it might be for the first two weeks that they only play video games together and that she works her lessons around that. Um, but they've got to make it fun for him. He, he, it, the reward has to be bigger than the feelings that he's having, that this is a negative experience. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm catching up here. Um, Ken says he gets ABA five days a week and we're working on it, but he's persistent about it being little Caesars and will not eat anything else for days if he doesn't get it. Well, because it works, right? Um, because he, what he's saying to you, if we could translate it is he's saying little Caesars is, is the most important thing to me. I've got to have little Caesars to feel okay. And if I don't have little Caesars, I don't feel okay. Now I don't know why that is. And it might be because he's having an allergic reaction to everything, including little Caesars pizza. We've seen kids who crave the thing that they're allergic to. It might be that everything else hurts his stomach. It might be that he feels safe because good things have happened when you've been to Little Caesars before. I'm glad that you're working with an ABA team. I hope that they're working on the self-injurious behavior thing. But I would certainly, as a parent, be saying to them, you guys, we the first thing we need to establish is that that he has to have some trust with us. That if I that if I ask for Little Caesars, that there's a potential that I will get it. Like, you know, but that, you know, that we can all, that has to be earned, right? That we don't give it away for free. 
Um, and that maybe you take the focus off of that for a little while and say, okay, what are, what are five other things that we really want to work on with this individual that could have something to do with the pizza, not with the pizza, but that we say, okay, you can have little Caesar's pizza day, but you got to work on this, this, and this. Um, but I want to make sure that your ABA people have somebody who's an expert in self-injurious behavior because it's a serious business, Ken. But uh, I also want to make sure, cause we're running out of time. I want to talk about the difference between tantrums and meltdowns. We've talked really specifically in this hour about the fact that tantrums are about, you know, I want something or I want something to go away. I have a need for something and I want it and I don't have the ability to communicate it. So I'm going to revert back to that earlier form of communication that is very effective, right? And we've talked about how to kind of cut it off at the past, but sometimes our kids have meltdowns. And what is the difference between a tantrum and a meltdown? And for me, as a parent, the difference is that when somebody is having a tantrum, it's because they want something or the absence of something. And when we give it to them, the tantrum stops instantaneously. So in the example of the Caesar's little uh, Caesar's pizza, if, if, you know, if he says, I want Caesar's pizza, and you say to him, no, and he throws a tantrum and then you go, all right, we'll go to Caesar's pizza. And he goes, okay. And he puts his shoes on and he gets done with the tantrum. That's a tantrum. Very effective tantrums are. Meltdowns are when even if we gave you the thing you wanted, you would still be upset. That you have just crossed a threshold and you are upset. And even giving you the thing you want, not going to end it. And we've all, I hope, I hope experientially that you guys have all experienced it because I have, um, I've had meltdowns. I've had meltdowns as an adult because I'm allergic to wheat. And if I have a wheat infraction, there's a meltdown waiting to happen. And I know what it feels like for me. And I, it's like, I, I, I start with something that I'm upset about that I could be upset about any day, but then I can't, my whole body is hot. It feels like there's bumps underneath my skin and I'm not rational anymore. I'm telling you as an adult, I'm not rational anymore. That's just the truth of it. So I, and when I see kids have meltdowns, there's almost always a sensory component to a meltdown. Um, and it, and it can be something internal or external that we see kids that are in rooms with fluorescent lighting, that the lighting, the timing isn't just right on it. And it, this, this, this. And so there are things that a kid could handle in any other place, but they get into that room and they are a mess and they're upset and they're out of control um, because they can't handle all that stimulus. We see that sometimes it's what a kid will eat. Kids who are allergic to milk, if you doubt me, there is an old, old, old Phil Donahue show where they took kids who had uh, milk allergies and they showed them playing nicely. Uh, and this is so unethical, but it but it really helped a lot of us to understand food allergies, uh, but unethical. We would never do this again. Right. But they showed the kids being nice and they said, we're, we're going to everybody here's some milk and we're going to go to a commercial break. They came back and it was mayhem. The kids were screaming and throwing things and hysterical because when you have a food allergy, it's bad. I can tell you firsthand. So when your kiddo is having a meltdown, you got to really be a sensory detective and really look at that what happened before. And there's something called EOs, uh, establishing operations, things that are already on board that, you know, it could be that the child didn't have enough sleep. It could be that they're having intestinal flare up and so they're having some diarrhea. And so their ability to be able to maintain and composure out the window, and that would be true for any of us, but especially for a child, right? So if, if you're having tantrums, that's one thing. And I really want to encourage you, you got to be looking at the tantrum and going, what's happening before, what's happening after, how can we change these things? How can, and, but, and not how can we punish them? Notice that nobody said anything about punishing in this whole hour, right? But how can we up their enjoyment? How can we make this better for them? Because they're, what they're saying is, I don't like this. I don't like this and I want this to, this to change. So how can we teach them how to ask for it to change? How can we change it for them? How can we make it more reinforcing? How can we make turn this into a treat? 
How can we make this more fun for them? That's really how we want to be looking at tantrums. Meltdowns are that extra thing when you see, you know, it's happening and it goes off the rails. And the main thing when, when somebody is in the middle of a meltdown is to be compassionate, make them as safe as possible, clear the area so that they cannot hurt themselves and stay with them. You don't leave them alone, but don't try to intervene. Don't try to talk to them about, you shouldn't be this upset. It's all wasted breath. Minimize sensory things when a meltdown is happening. If you got to turn the lights off, turn music off. If, you know, if they're getting red, if you're in a place where you can take the shirt off, because it might be the tag on the shirt to help them to calm down. But we treat them how we would want to be treated if we were having some sort of a, like, you know, sensory uh, catastrophic event. How would you want to be treated if you were already sensory overloaded? You wouldn't want somebody trying to teach you something. You wouldn't want somebody making fun of you. You, you would would only want to feel safe. And so that's what we want to be doing during a meltdown. During a tantrum, the things that we want to be doing in the middle of a tantrum are taking data. In our heads, you become a court reporter where you think to yourself, okay, we're having a tantrum. What is? What are they doing? What does this tantrum look like? Because I'm going to need to write down in my journal later on what it is. And as you're looking at what they're doing, scan the area, see, do I, is there anything, like, are they throwing things? Do I need to put that vase that my grandmother gave away so that they can't get to that? Um, what do I need to do to keep them safe? What do I need to do to keep everybody else safe? And what do I need to do to keep the, you know, the property safe, right? Focus on that first. Once you get that under control, then start asking yourself what happened right before. And if you've got the time and the space, if you're calm enough to say, what, what is it that I think they want? Don't say this out loud, but you know, think to yourself, what is it that I think they want right now? Is it that they wanted my attention? Did they want something to stop? Is there something that they wanted more of, or is there some sensory thing that they are wanting more or less of, right? Those are usually the four suspects for most of our kids. If you have an older kid, it could just be that they wanted control of the moment, right? Which we all do. Come on, right? So you start asking yourself, what do I think that they want that led to this tantrum? And whatever you think that it was, you don't give that to them. Because if you do, if you go, well, I think what they wanted was my attention. And if I give it to them now, then what they will have learned is that I need to kick and scream and throw things for dad to pay attention to me. Now, when I say don't give them the attention, that, that does not mean you leave the room or you leave them alone. I'm talking about giving attention to the behavior, not the child right? We don't give attention to the behavior. Attention to the behavior means things like saying, hey, stop kicking, stop screaming, stop doing that. Uh, what is it you want? That's attention to the behavior. Uh, instead, what we do is that we stay with them in the room, but we busy ourselves with something small and minute, like maybe you just drink your bottle of water. Or maybe you sit and look at the pattern of your fingernails, right? Of, the, of the, the markings on your fingerprints, right? You get very, you don't do a lot of movement, but you're in the room with them. You're cognizant of what's happening. You're listening for them. You're not making a lot of eye contact, but you're not ignoring the child. You're ignoring the behavior that they're engaged in right now. And, and that's hard. And sometimes it's helpful if you have somebody there to help you, to talk you through it. Sometimes you don't have that. And so you got to talk yourself through it. And you say, okay, what, what happened? They're, they threw the tantrum. I think the antecedent before was that, you know, they asked to go to Little Caesar's Pizza and I told them no. So what, what is it that they want? They want the pizza, right. I'm supposed to not give them the thing that they want. Um, so I'm supposed to give them the complete opposite because the behavior that they're engaged in, I don't want them to think this is what wins the day. So maybe you go, well, I'm not going to give them little Caesar's pizza. So I'm going to go in the kitchen and I'm going to start preparing them something else. Now that's only if you can still see them from the kitchen. I, I really want to get rid of this idea of ignoring the child means leaving them. They were trying to communicate with you and leaving them cuts off the ability to communicate. Don't leave them. 
unless it's an open kitchen for, format. Otherwise, just get small, get small, do something. It might make them crazy that you are not doing what they want, because that was the whole reason for the tantrum to begin with. This is what I call about holding down the fort. You got to keep breathing and saying to yourself, I love my child. I'm a good parent. Right now they're engaged in a behavior because they think that this is going to work. I have to teach them this behavior doesn't work for this thing, but I'm going to do that with love and compassion. I'm not going to berate them. I'm not going to lecture them. I'm just going to sit here quietly and I'm going to let them wear themselves out. And I'm going to know that we're all going to be okay, that this is tried and true and tested. And if I have a group of professionals, I'm going to report this to them later on. And they're going to tell me, you know, I, other strategies that I can do. Um, okay. So, um, Ka says, oh, thank you so much. I'm seeing it through a new pair of eyes and it's helpful. Thank you so much. Hi, Dr. Nassim. So I hope that's helpful. And I'm sorry for the panic in the middle with the, with my computer. Uh, it happens, right? Uh, it's hilarious. Please feel free to make fun of me. Um, <laughs> because the point is, we can be compassionate. These tantrums are not weird, strange, or odd. Our kids are not weird, strange, or odd. We are not weird, strange, or odd. We all have things that we want. We all communicate in different ways to get them. And sometimes we are not as effective or as efficient as we want to be. But we can get better at that. We can get better at communicating to our kids. If you want Little Caesar's Pizza, this is how you're going to have to ask for it. We can do that. If we want, we can help our kids to get better at asking for these things so that they can get their needs met. And that really is what's at the base of all of it. Now, the meltdowns, be a, a good sensory detective and start asking yourself all kinds of questions. What did they eat? You know, have they had enough sleep? Are they wearing anything that's itchy? Did we, you know, do we have any rashes? Um, does, does it look like they are hot or cold? Cause sometimes when you're having an allergic reaction to it, it presents with heat, right? Um, you know, look at the, look at them. Are they having diarrhea? Are they showing any signs where they're pushing against any part of their body, like their stomach or their head? Like when he's hurting himself, is there a specific place that he's hurting himself? Because we will see kids that will push in on their eyes when they're having a headache. Yeah. So be a sensory detective, take all that into consideration because that's how we become empathetic and helpful and supportive and compassionate allies working with tantrums and meltdowns. They're not odd. They're not weird. And we absolutely can change the, the pattern of behavior. Absolutely. Uh, if we are consistent and mindful and compassionate and empathetic. I hope that helped. Hey, tomorrow, oh, so exciting. We're having, I fingers crossed that everything go well today. We are debuting a new episode of Stories from the Spectrum. This is all content that is created by people in the neurodiverse community. We, all of it. You're not going to see me anywhere. Brian, I'm so sorry you arrived late, but I'm glad that you're here um, and I hope that you'll watch back to see everything that we said about tantrums and meltdowns. Um, and if you guys have more questions, always feel free to reach out directly to me, Shannon at autism live.com. But don't miss tomorrow's episode. We're debuting some new segments from some new creative, uh, artists. And you're absolutely, if you're an old car enthusiast, we've got something for you. And Spencer Hart is debuting her program, Heart to Heart, with a really wonderful celebrity guest. I think you're just going to love it, you guys. Stories from the Spectrum, that's tomorrow. And then we are back on Monday. We're going to be doing another one of these shows with another topic where we're just going to take this apart. We want to hear from you guys. Is there anything in particular that you want me to sound off on and give you the parent-to-parent -parent rundown? on uh, because we're going to be doing a whole series of these throughout this summer. I love and respect all of you. You're all amazing. You're doing a great job. And uh, I just want to be here and be your cheerleader and help you to get to all the good things because life can get significantly better. But that functional communication piece has to be on board for everyone to be able to effectively say what their needs are. Yeah. Much love. I, I will see you uh, back here tomorrow for stories on.
on the spectrum. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. See you next time.